Okay, uh, welcome to the review session for the final exam. This is actually a reshoot of the video I did yesterday because it got completely messed up trying to upload to Canvas, um, with Canvas not working, and then my desktop computer crashed where the video was recorded. So hopefully it's not too late uh, to go through this. I had several people ask me to do certain problems, and so we'll address those uh, here today. <coughs> um, First, a few words about the final exam itself. Um, there's 37, 37 questions. I've broken these apart into the cumulative material, which covers the stuff on exams one, two, and three, and then the new material in two separate sections in that order. Uh, the cumulative part is 142 points, and the new material is 58, so it's about 70% actually cumulative. Um, so I don't know if that's good or bad for you, but uh, if you've been studying like I've told you, that should be an advantage. Because I did do what I said I was going to do, and I took questions off exams 1, 2, and 3, changed the numbers, or had you solve for A instead of B, or what have you. And so the questions should all look familiar if you've looked at them. Uh, there's 37 questions on the exam, but some of them are, you know, you recognize something, pick it out of a series or something like this. For example, like, what's the most viscous liquid? Of these four, so that shouldn't take too too much time uh, for you to do. So here's the first question that somebody asked from the audience, and that was how to determine the Van't Hoff factor for a solution. And the Van't Hoff factor uh, is the letter I, and we'll get to the equation in a sec. And let's say we have a 4.71 times 10 to the minus fifth molar solution of we don't know what it is, but this could allow you to figure out if you had a series of unknowns, right? that has an osmotic pressure of 2.626 torr at 25 degrees C. So how do we go about doing this? Well, again, if you've prepared, right, right now you should know, hopefully, what equation we're going to use for this. The osmotic pressure equation is this one. I, MRT, equals pi. Pi is the osmotic pressure. This is the Van't Hoff factor I that we're looking for. Molarity, <coughs> gas constant, temperature. And it's important to realize that with this particular problem, you want to use the gas constant in units of liters, atmospheres, over moles times Kelvin, not 8.314. That's the energy term. So, if we start plugging things in here, what you're going to do is that pressure is 2.626 torr, and R 0 0.8206 liters atmospheres or moles times Kelvin. So we have our units here. In atmospheres, these are in Tor, we have to convert that. But that should be no problem. And there's the relationship. One atmosphere is 760 Tor. And so from that, then what we're gonna find is that pi in the units of atmospheres is 3.45 times 10 to the minus 3. Wait. Yeah. So once we have that, we're pretty much ready to go. If we plug our values into here, this one goes on the left hand side. Our unknown. The concentration of the solution was 4.71 times 10 to the negative 5 molar. We're going to 
multiply that by our value of R. And then that in turn is going to be multiplied by our temperature. And that has to be in Kelvin. So we have 25 degrees C, that's 298 Kelvin. And that's the setup. Um, and if you'll notice what will happen, this has to end up being a dimensionless number, and it will be when you multiply out the units. And so when you multiply everything here and then divide both sides of the equation by that, you're going to find that I is equal to 3. And that could be something like calcium chloride or cobalt-3 chloride or something like that. Or cobalt-2 chloride, rather, sorry. So, for example, compounds, this one, that one, etc. Somebody has three pieces that dissociate in solution. So the Van Hoff factor, again, is the number of ions in a solution of an ionic compound. So I will pause this while I put up the next problem to save time and space uh, and hopefully allow a successful upload. So back in a minute. It's the second problem that someone asked about is question 19 on exam 1, which is determining the activation energy for a reaction given uh, a rate constant at one temperature and another rate constant at a different temperature. So what we want to be able to do is for this reaction, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what it is, in fact. Um, we want to determine Ea, the activation energy. And for that, and here's our data, we are going to use the Arrhenius equation, which is ln A2 over K1 equals Ea over R times 1 minus T1, sorry, times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. So again, this is the form that we've been dealing with it in. You can reverse these two quantities, but then those change position as well. And here's the kinetic data. So the key to solving one of these problems, at least as far as I'm concerned, is you have to keep track of what you're doing. You can call whichever rate constant you want K1, but then you have to remain consistent with that. So let's do this. T1 is 15 degrees C, T2 is 110. That means K1 is 1.89 times 10 to the minus 3, and K2 is 1.11 times 10 to the minus 2. So as long as you keep that straight, this should be relatively easy again to do. And we're just going to plug our values in to this equation. So I'll go through this in a little more mathematical detail for you since it has natural logs and things like that in it. So, the setup. K1 is on the bottom, K2 is on the top. R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin per mole. That's the energy form. And again, it's the same constant as we used in the last problem, but this is a, the units you need to have it in for this. And 
1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. Again, these have to be in Kelvin, so all I did is added 290, or 273 rather, to 15 to get this one, and likewise to 110 to get uh, t2. So that's the setup. If we then divide this out, you'll find that it becomes 5.873, and there's no units on there, which is important because you can't take the natural log of something that does have units. And then, if we go through here um, and do our division, we get 5.873. Three point four seven times ten to the minus two inverse kelvins, minus two point six one times ten to the minus three inverse kelvins. Then, if we take the natural log of our number here, that becomes one point seven seven zero. That's going to be. term we're looking for times 0 0.0321 inverse columns. So that's the difference between those two. Now, you can divide both sides of the equation by this quantity, 0 0.0321 inverse columns, and we will get Fifty-five point one six kelvins. See what the EA over R. And if we multiply both sides by R, we're going to find that the activation energy is four hundred and fifty-eight joules per mole. Four hundred and fifty-eight joules per mole. So that is how you approach a problem like that question on the exam. There are any equations provided, of course, as is 8.314 joules per kelvin per mole. And so this reaction is relatively facile to get going because that's a pretty low energy of activation. So the other question that came up was balancing a redox equation. So I'll just keep the video rolling here. For this, let's do a reaction in basic solution, so under basic conditions. And so essentially you're doing the acidic one with a little bit more stuff added in at the end. And let's take this equation right here. Okay, so these are usually how these problems are written, like this. And you'll notice that there's oxygens and things on one side, but not on the other. But the important thing that you've got to be able to do for this is realize what gets oxidized and what gets reduced. And so here, <coughs> we have chromium in the plus six oxidation state. Because if you take this, and oxygen is always negative two, that's negative 14, there's an excess two minus charge. You have to balance that then with a positive 12, we get two chromium, so plus six, and it turns into chromium three plus. 
the iron 2 on the reactant side becomes iron 3. And so that one is probably pretty obvious what it is. That's the oxidation. So that's the oxidation half reaction. What I did there is what you have to do, and it'll be more obvious when we do the chromium part, is I balanced it for mass. It's already done. One iron and one iron. Then I balanced it for charge. We had a plus two on this side. And before I put the electron there, a plus three here. But if you balance the charge, now both sides are plus two. So the first step in doing this, after you identify the half reactions, is to balance them for mass first, then charge. Don't do it in reverse, because it'll take multiple, multiple steps to get that done. Now, we'll do the redox. Other part, the reduction. And so, a little more room here. We have chromium 3 plus and chromium plus 6 hidden over here. Balance for mass first. And the first step of balancing for mass is balance the oxygens with water molecules. Don't do anything else first, do that first. And if that's the case, then we're going to balance our oxygens with water molecules. There's seven oxygens over here that requires seven water molecules. Now we've messed up the works. We've put hydrogen in there, but then you balance hydrogen with H plus. Seven times two is 14. So on the reactant side, make sure you can see that. Yep, 14 H plus goes there. So now mass is balanced, we balance for charge. Over here, we have a net of plus three, or do we? I didn't balance for mass properly there, did I? Two chromiums requires two chromiums. And so that's not going to change anything with what we just did, but that does mean that the net charge over here is plus six. Two times plus three is plus six. So I forgot to balance the chromium. Now over here, we've got a net charge of plus 12 because I've got 14 H plus, so 14 plus minus two, that leaves us with plus 12. So we have to balance this for charge now. And the way we'll do that is add six electrons as a reactant. And so this is the reduction half reaction, now balanced for mass and charge properly. Now we add the two together. We add all the reactants up. We add all the products up to give one equation. And so if I do that, then, again, I'm skipping a step. Right? So the important thing that you have to realize is that we're going to take this guy and multiply it by a factor of six. Because I have six electrons as a reactant from the reduction half reaction. I want six electrons as a product of the oxidation reaction, so the electrons cancel one another out. So the next step is to do that. And of course, that's just going to give us this critical thing there being the six electrons, six iron threes, and six iron twos as a reactant. So once you're done with that, now is when you combine. You have the electrons at the same number in the oxidation reaction and the, re and the reduction reaction. So if we do that, then this is going to become the 
as follows. And then we are going to cancel out like terms. And so our like terms here, I would have six electrons as a reactant. We have six electrons as a product. Those will cancel. And then we have now our redox reaction. So let me rewrite it with everything on one line. So, and if the question asked you to balance this reaction under acidic conditions, that would be the answer. But it didn't. It asked you to do it under basic conditions. So there's another couple of steps involved. And what those are involve taking out the H pluses and then canceling out like terms. So what we're going to do is we have H plus as a reactant. So we're going to add 14 hydroxides to quote unquote neutralize those 14 H pluses. But what you do to one side, you've got to do to the other, otherwise your equation will not be balanced anymore. So there we go. We've got to do it to the product side too. Now, what happens is This, the protons react with the hydroxides to give that, HOH, which is H2O, water molecules. Each proton that's absorbed, if you will, by a hydroxide gives one water molecule. So this net set of reactants here is going to give us 14 water molecules. So if I rewrite now this... That's what I get. 14 waters, the dichromate anion, 6 iron 2 plus as the reactant, goes to 2 chromium 3 pluses, 7 waters, and 6 iron 3 plus. Now we have like terms on each side of the equation, and we're going to take those out by subtracting 7 waters from each side. And then we're finished, finally. And so that's going to leave us with oops, these three reactants. We're going to have only seven waters instead of 14. And that's going to go to oh, I forgot the that's still there. This is what we added before. That doesn't go anywhere because there's no H plus for it to react with. And this is our balanced equation. And so we can see that 7H2O plus dichromate plus 6 iron 2 plus goes to 2 chromium 3 plus, 6 iron 3 plus, and 14 hydroxides. You're under basic conditions, the hydroxides are present, and that solves that problem. Now you may be asking yourself, how are we going to be asked a question like this 
on a multiple choice exam, and I'll let you in on a little secret. The way the question is phrased is, for example, not necessarily like this, but how many hydroxide molecules are there on the product side of the balance reaction? 6, 7, 14, 20, 14. I'll set up the next problem and be right back. Okay, so another question that was asked, and understandably so, because this was the last week of class that we did this, um, an electrochemistry question. And there's yet another electrochemistry question we'll do after this one. Um, and it was, how do you calculate delta G for a galvanic cell? Well, you will be given the cell makeup like this. CD, a single line, CD2+, plus, a double line, PB2+, plus, a single line, PB. And what that means, what we're getting to here, is that this is the species that's oxidized. This is the species that's reduced. So we have the oxidation half over here and the reduction half over here. And the double line represents the salt bridge. So that's the shorthand way to represent a galvanic cell. And you have to realize that the thing to the left of the double line is the oxidation process. And the thing to the right is the reduction process. That's how you identify which is which. Now, you'll be given, should this question be on the exam, it will, not this exact one, you'll be given two standard potential reactions. Remember, these are always written as reductions. Here's the one for cadmium, here's the one for lead. And with that comes a standard potential for, ca for cadmium. It's zero point, negative 0 0.40 volts. And for lead, it's negative 0 0.13 volts. And so that also is provided as part of the problem. Like I said, I will not give you a table of a bunch of stuff that you've got to look through to find what you need. You get the cell, you get the relevant reactions, you get the relevant standard potentials. All you need to be able to do is use that knowledge. So <clears throat> what are we going to do? Well, the equation that goes with this is this one. Delta G is negative N, F. Make that actually look like a G. So, that you have to calculate. So delta G naught is equal to negative N, F, E naught cell. E naught cell is calculated. N is the number of electrons that are transferred. And so we're losing two electrons, or gaining two electrons. N is two. And so that's important to be able to recognize. F is the Faraday constant, which is provided. So the next step, then, is to calculate E cell. And the way we've been doing that is that E cell is equal to the standard potential for the species that's reduced minus the standard potential for the species that's oxidized. And so we had the values up there. All you do is you use them as written. Don't change the sign for the oxidized one. You don't have to. That's already taken into account by this equation here. So this is why it's important to be able to realize this is the oxidation thing. This is the reduction. right? So we're going to put in here now. Negative 0 0.13 volts for the redu reduced part because that was the one that was associated with the standard potential for lead. We're going to subtract from that uh, negative 0 0.40 volts. So negative, negative, that's going to give us a positive. That's why this is important. And so the cell potential is 0 0.37 volts positive. So again, don't change the sign here. Because if this process is actually going to happen, right, 
What that means is that cadmium and lead have their relative positions on the activity series. Right? One must be above the other for that to happen. And if the process is going to happen, it's got to be spontaneous. This has to be positive. So why ask a question like this if the process doesn't happen anyway? So again, you want that to come out positive. Then it's just a matter of using this equation and the setup. That's F, which again will be provided 96,485 coulombs per mole, that's the Faraday constant. And then you plug in there what we calculated for the cell potential. When all is said and done, then you will get value of 71,399 joules, which you can convert to 71.4 kilojoules. And that is negative because of the negative sign that came here. And so this is how we figure out the free energy for a redox process in a galvanic cell. And so that is uh, a critical thing to be able to do. And that's the answer to that particular problem. Back with the next one. So one other question that was asked about electric chemistry is <coughs> I'm using the Nernst equation. And there's a number of things we can do with it. But unfortunately, we ran pretty short on time and didn't get to cover the entire scope of it. But what we did do <coughs> is use it to find the uh, ratio of the ions that are present in a galvanic cell under non-standard conditions. And so an example problem, like what we did in class, and like you might see, is this one. Calculate the ratio of cadmium 2 plus ions to lead 2 plus ions of E is measured to be plus 0 0.19 volts at 20 degrees C in this galvanic cell. This is the same galvanic cell from the last problem that we did. Um, so we know for this <coughs> that E naught was plus 0 0.37 volts. So we calculated that from the cell potentials and all that sort of thing. And so <coughs> you can take a look at that for a minute if you want. Um, but what do we do? We're going to use the Nernst equation. So this is E under non-standard non conditions. This is the standard E, which you calculate from the standard reduction potentials. Um, minus RT, NF, LN, Q. So again, this is the gas constant. That's got to be in the energy units, joules per Kelvin per mole, temperature in Kelvin, Faraday constant, and N is the number of moles of electrons that are transferred, which we saw for this was two. <coughs> so again, it's a matter of putting everything together. Now, <coughs> what is Q is the question. Here's what happens, is that if we take the reactions as they're actually occurring, right, the cadmium is oxidized, and the lead 2 plus is reduced. So if we combine these two equations together, <coughs> we 
electrons will cancel out and to write it as equilibrium, all right, there's only going to be four things present, and that is this. So, as a result of that, right, what's Q is the concentration of cadmium ions over the concentration of lead ions. That's the ratio of cadmium 2 plus ions to lead 2 plus ions. So what you want to do and this problem is solved for Q. So let's get to it. Um, we plug in values and off we go. So the measure of potential under non standard conditions is <coughs> 0.19 volts. And we calculated 0.37 volts for the standard potential of the cell. There's R, T is 293 kelvins. That's 20 degrees C converted to kelvins. Two electrons, two moles of electrons, and Faraday's constant, and all that times L and Q. So if we subtract the potentials, the 0.37 volts from both sides, we're going to be left with negative 0.18 volts. This term right here, once we compute it, is negative 0 0.0126 joules per coulomb. A volt is a joule per coulomb. So if we divide both sides by this quantity, then we're going to find that L and Q is equal to 14.26. So then, if we raise both sides to E, not plus, we'll find Q is 1.56 times 10 to the 6th, and that's equal to 0.0. our ion ratio that we were asked to find. <clears throat> so again, this is just a matter of uh, putting the values in and knowing where to do it. And so that's the solution to that problem. All right, finally, there was a question about doing a titration of a weak acid with a strong base. And here's an example problem of that. 100 milliliters of a 1.05 molar HN3, that's hydrozoic acid solution, is titrated with 50 milliliters of a sodium hydroxide solution to the equivalence point. So let me highlight that. What is the pH? of the solution at the equivalence point, and you're given the Ka value. So one of the things that might jump out at you uh, the first time you see a problem like this, or even the tenth time you see a problem like this, um, is, hey, uh, what's the concentration of this? How are we supposed to do this? You, know, you don't need it. And the reason for that is, you have to understand what the equivalence point means, right? So, um, so 
stand over here if you want to pause that to read it for a second. Um, so what is the equivalent? I'll leave the KE value up here. At the equivalence point, what we're doing is the following thing, right? We have our weak acid and our strong base. And that's going to take us to a salt and water. At the equivalence point, all of this has been consumed. The other thing to realize is that at the equivalence point, so is all, in this case, NaOH. What you've done to get to the equivalence point is you've added just enough sodium hydroxide to react with all of the hydrozoic acid or whatever weak acid it is that's present and completely consume both things. Once you pass the equivalence point, if you continue to add sodium hydroxide, well then there would be some hydroxide left because there's none of this to react with. And before the equivalence point, right, there's still some of this around too. So at the equivalence point, those guys are gone and only these are present. That's the key being able to solve this problem. You have to understand that that's what the equivalence point is. Now, we did in the third exam have a problem where you titrated a strong acid with a strong base. The same thing's true. The strong acid is completely gone, all the base is completely gone, and you have a salt, the conjugate base, whatever acids you had, and water formed. But in that case, the pH is 7.00. This is not the case with hydrozoic acid being titrated because Upon titrating it, you do remove all of this, but you do make that. And you have in this the conjugate base of a weak acid now in solution. Remember, conjugate bases of weak acids have basic properties. They will react with the water in the solution that they're in to produce hydroxide ions. So the pH will be larger than 7, not lower, always higher. And that's what we're looking to do. We're going to find that out. So, we first have to figure out how much of that conjugate base we've got. Now, my silly me re erased the uh, reaction. Let's put it back up. Here's what we're looking for. There's a stoichiometry problem you gotta do, but this one's really straightforward. It's really easy because <clears throat> all these things are consumed, right? And all the stoichiometric coefficients are one. One mole of this reacts with one mole of that. One mole of acid reacts with one mole of base to give, there's the key, one mole of sodium azide and one mole of water molecule. So, what we need to know is the number of moles of azide. Sodium is a spectator ion, it doesn't matter. But what you do know is that one mole of hydrozoic acid will produce one mole of sodium azide. So, the quick stoichiometric calculation that you can do is as follows, and I'll write it out step by step here. We had 100 milliliters of HN3. That's how much solution we had. And we were given the concentration of that 
Let's convert this just for the heck of it. Get this out of my way. So we're given the concentration. of 1.05 moles per liter. If <coughs> I multiply that out, that tells me that I've got 1.575 moles of acid to start with. Once all the acid is gone, what we realized is that and this is again sort of the key step right here, is that one mole of HN3 that's consumed gives one mole of azide. So the number of moles of azide that's generated is the same as the number of moles of hydrozoic acid that she started with. One point five seven five moles of azide. Now you're in a position to figure out, okay, how much hydroxide does that produce? So what goes on, the way we approach these problems is in a stepwise fashion. We do the stoichiometry first. Then the resulting product solution goes to equilibrium. We did the stoichiometry part, now I've got to do the equilibrium part. So, what we need now is the concentration of, ah, not that, this. Got the number of moles. Do we have the volume? We sure do. But here's the thing. We had a hundred milliliters of solution to start. hydrozoic acid solution, that is, we added sodium hydroxide. We don't know the concentration of sodium hydroxide. We don't need to know the concentration of sodium hydroxide because we know that it consumed that much hydrozoic acid. In fact, that's how many moles of it you need to do it to. But you did add it as a solution. So, The 50 milliliters, the volume there of water that you added is still present. So if you did this in a, in a beaker, right, you would start with your solvent level being at the 100 milliliter mark. And when you're done, it'd be the 150 milliliter mark. So you have to consider the total volume. And that is. Sometimes a sticking point, right? But once you've figured that out, then <clears throat> we're going to find, double check my math. Something not right here. So, if I did that right, yeah, sorry, it's 10.5 molar. Now we do the ice chart. Get ahead of 
myself here. Here's what's happening now. The azide reacts with water to give hydrozoic acid and hydroxide. This is going to affect or give us what the pH is, right? So, our initial concentration of this is 10.5, and these are zero. All right, so this is exactly now the same thing as if you were given a 10.5 molar solution of sodium azide, or asked to find the pH of that. So, our ice chart. The usual. Here's our Ka value. And so we're going to set this up. Again, this is all old news. We're going to assume that x is small, and so we're going to put this expression as such, and then solve for x. <coughs> so If you do that, let me do it real quick. X is 0 0.0141. So that is small compared to 10.5, so we're good. And remember, you'll never have to use a quadratic on the final. Here's the other thing what is that? You have to make sure you realize that that's the concentration of hydroxide, not H plus or H3O plus. So if we, there are a couple of ways you can do it, of course, but if we take the natural log of that, the negative log of that, rather, we're going to find that it's 1.85. But remember, that's pOH. But if we want the pH, we have this equation. So pOH, pH. It's 14 minus 1.85, which is pOH. And so that <clears throat> then is 12.15. That's the pH of that solution. So pretty 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 basic, right? But you had a lot of material too. So <clears throat> if that's the case, then that's how you do this, all right? At the equivalence point, remember all of the Weak acid is gone. However many moles of that weak acid were present is how many moles of its conjugate base that you've produced. Divide that by the total volume, meaning the amount in milliliters or liters of the acid that you had and the amount of base that you added to it. Um, and then <clears throat> do the equilibrium with the ice chart and all that good stuff. And that's the pH. One more thing I'll touch on because it is related to this.
What's the pH of the half of fluid at this point? Otherwise known as the halfway point. Should this show up on the exam? You're given some weak acid being titrated with a strong base. And you're asked to find the pH of the half equivalence point. That should be a, give me however many points really fast because in any titration of a weak acid with a strong base, the pH at the half equivalence point is equal to pKa. And we did a derivative from in class where you saw this come out, but that's always the case. So to solve that problem, all you got to do is take the negative log of that guy. And you're going to find that the pH is 4.72. So keep that in mind. We did do that in class. It is on the study sheet. And that should be some good points. So that is the breadth of the questions that people asked. So I'm not going to cover uh, anything else. But the study sheet is a very very representative list of the new material part of your final exam worth 58 points. So again, know how to calculate delta G of a reaction or delta H of a reaction or delta S of a reaction from the respective free energies of formation, heats of formation, or standard entropies. Again, those are in these gigantic tables. You'll be given the relevant values, no more, no less. Be able to do that. Know how to get delta G of delta S and delta H. Know how to calculate the entropy of the universe. We spent quite a bit of time on all that stuff. It's going to appear in one form or the other. Um, and anything else that was on the study sheet, you're probably going to see. So um, hopefully this will get uploaded without any more issues. I think the Canvas thing has been resolved. Um, and you have, unfortunately, only about 24 hours to take a look at it. But uh, hopefully it's helpful and better than nothing. So I'll see you tomorrow for the exam. And good luck uh, with your preparation for that and any other tests you might have.